Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh, I see some return people. I love it. <laughs> we got our regular zooming in tonight. Hello, everyone. I'm going to give everyone about uh, three minutes to log on and we're going to kick this program off. It's going to be a good one. I watched the video earlier. Just go ahead and actually plop that into the here. Hello, everyone. We're going to start here at about 7.03. Everyone, a couple more minutes to get on here, get situated. <clears throat> Uh, I guess it would have to be in the chat here. Hello, everyone. I'm going to give everyone about a minute or so more, and we're going to get started. This is a good a good night for a savory pie episode here. <laughs> you ready for the holidays? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, kind of. <laughs> sort of, kind of. Well, a lot because I'm, I'm not cooking that much, which is like, sometimes I like, sometimes I don't like, but uh, no, it's, it's pretty awesome. It's, uh, it's gonna be good. I don't know, maybe I might knock out one of these pies like really quick. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I think my favorite was the one with the turnips in it, but I won't spoil it for those uh, folks here <laughs> signing on. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in about one minute. It's 7.02. We're going to kick it off at 7.03. It is chilly tonight. What's the temperature down there in Carolina, well, South in, Carolina? I'm up in Western Pennsylvania, so we're in like oh. we're in the high 20s. <laughs> You're north of us here in Virginia. Okay. <laughs> in the high 20s. It's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. a little chilly. A little chilly. Just a little bit. Yeah, we, I think I wish we were all around that hearth right now, getting ready to eat some of your food. I know. <laughs> like, have that hearth raging fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful in the winter, right? But, oh. Oh, yeah. It's crazy summer. in the summer. Yeah. Awesome. All right, it's 7.03, so we're going to kick it off. Uh, welcome, everyone, to another addition to our Foodways series at Stratford Hall. My name is Dr. Kelly Fonto dietz I'm the Director of Collections and Visitor Engagement at Stratford. I'm also in charge of programs. I am a former chef and food enthusiast and history enthusiast, and I'm here tonight, of course, with the one and only Justin Cherry, the best historical colonial baker dude I know. How are you tonight? <laughs> Pretty good, pretty good, hanging in there. Be better awesome. if I was by a nice warm hearth or oven. That, that's I know, sure. I'm freezing too, so I'm, I'm sure everyone's a little chilly. <laughs> so for those of you that Zoomed in last Tuesday, you saw Justin made that really beautiful bread that had the spelt and the corn and it was crusty and delicious. Tonight he's gonna be showing and talking about these incredible meat pies that he made a few weeks ago. I have to tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll wax poetic about them after you watch the video, but I would probably cut off part of my finger to eat some, like one of those right now. They were so <laughs> delicious. So yeah, um, yeah, it's great. It's always great to have you come cook at Stratford, Justin. It is now. The oven's amazing. The hearth is amazing. It's amazing just to be able to work with that kind of original, um, you know, it's a tool, you know, like anything else, it's of the 18th century, it's it's a tool. You know, the hearth is a tool, the oven's a tool. They kind of feed off of each other. And without them, there is no existing life because there is no food. So yeah, no, seriously. Those things they're they're a necessary Our beauty. <laughs> yeah. No, they're 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 a necessity and they're just so amazing to work with. Um, and it's it's a time capsule. It absolutely is something that you know, everybody always wishes like, oh, I wish I could cook like, uh, you know, folks did back then. And it's like, well, this is it. Like, not much has changed. <laughs> and it's, it's a time capsule. Every time you start that fire, whether it's the hearth or whether it's the oven, it's just like, you can imagine um, who is eating, who's doing the cooking, who is, who is being all these, uh, 
you know, things that you think of when you think of, you know, 18th century life. And it, it cuts a pretty clear picture of, you know, not only culture, but, you know, how food, how American food got, you know, formed. So that's, it's an amazing thing. It really is. Well, and we always love having you on site and looking forward to people like yourself and Dontavious Williams and Nicole Moore and Cheney McKnight and others who are going to be joining us for more Foodways programs this spring. We're going to have an all-star lineup. And it's just, it's so wonderful to have this kitchen, which I think is pretty incredible, get so much attention uh, brought to it after all these years of being dormant. And it's a wonderful stage, literally, to talk about the history of enslaved people and the colony and in the Americas and people like Richard Mindnet, who was an indentured chef who was from uh, England, and the Lees, you know, the Lees were eating like kings and queens in a colony that was, you know, pretty poor for the most part, except for a small percentage of folks like the Lees that really had money to eat whatever they wanted. Oh, yeah. So well, I, I want to go ahead and show the video and it's quite amazing. So depending on your internet speed at home, sometimes when I show these videos, it drags a little bit. So what I'm doing tonight is I'm gonna show it like I normally do. So I will show it on my screen, but if for some reason it starts to skip or get weird, go ahead and go into the chat and you will see the link to the YouTube video. And what you can do is just open that up and watch it at home and it might be a little bit faster not coming through the the internet if it's if it's easier that way so sometimes people's connections are a little bit you know less stronger than others and so therefore you need to go ahead and directly link that so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen and like i said if you need to go ahead and watch the video on your own. It's 12 minutes long, so just be sure to watch it with us. So when you come back on, you are uh, ready to hear all the wonderful things we'll be talking about afterwards. So let me make this big. All right. It would help if I put the volume on. <laughs> Hi, my name is Justin Cherry and we're in the Stratford Hall Kitchens and we're going to be making some pasties and meat pork pies that were made famous by a book that came out in the 1720s by Edward Kidder of London. Um, they will be fired in the bake oven behind me, which is an original bake oven uh, to 1738. All right, so now we have our puff paste rolled out in front of us and that puff paste is going to be made from water, uh, a little bit of egg, some butter and spelt and both white lamas flour. Um, both of those wheats and spelts were grown on the estate. Um, a little bit set aside from the mill for household use. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll this out. And one will be for our standing crust pie and the other be for the pasty. And the pasties were known to have pretty intricate designs on the outside. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of fun doing a little bit of design work on the outside. And then the standing crust pie, uh, traditionally puff paste wasn't really eaten. It was more as a vessel and they would eat everything inside of it <clears throat> because of the hardness uh, that it would occur uh, almost when setting clay inside of a kiln. That's what it would act like inside the oven. So we'll roll it out just to about maybe a quarter of an inch and then we'll cut it and shape it and put it inside of our three-legged pans to go inside of the oven. All right, so now we're gonna cut out the shapes of the two pans um, and we're gonna cut them in a manner that's a little bit bigger than the actual pan itself so they'll kind of form and then we'll roll them out a little bit bigger 
and we'll put aside this dough and we'll save that for our top design. And the first one we'll roll out is for our pasty. Now it needs to be a little bit, you know, not too thin because we want to put our filling, uh, which is going to be a, a forced meat that's uh, per cook just a little bit so we can place it inside and all the juices and the fat will kind of soak into the pastry itself. So we'll round this out just a little bit and then we'll place it in our pan. And then we can make trims accordingly to the shape of the pan. We'll kind of cut it to outline the shape of the pan uh, because it will shrink up in the oven. So now that we have that one shaped up, we'll move to the larger one, uh, which will come up on the side. So we want it a little bit, um, not quite as thick, but we want it oversized a bit. So when it does shrink up, it's not uh, too low to cover the top, which will go on both of these. So we'll move this to our bigger pan. And we want to sort of just like ease it in. Uh, we don't want to press down. And if you're doing, you know, even like a pie crust, you always want to push kind of up and not down to make any tears. So we just want to form and trace the outside of that. And even if it overlaps a little bit, that's all right, because we'll press it into the actual pan and then we'll press up. And then we'll trim these up and next we'll add in our filling and then the top and then they'll go in the oven. All right, we'll trim these up just a bit to account for any shrinkage in the oven. And then we'll rework it down from the bottom to the top to ensure that there's no tears on the bottom. So again, kind of work it, but not press down. And we'll just let the dough give a little bit. And then any overlapping can be kind of worked in. The dough's nice and pliable. It's almost about room temperature. And remember, we'll be putting a top on this too, so you know, they should be workable enough. And then the pasty, which we'll put the filling here, it'll actually have a, a workable top. It'll almost be like a dome, like a giant hand pie. All right, so we've prepared our fillings. And one of them is a beef and pork standing crust pie. So we have already braised down a little bit our beef, uh, some turnip, potato, bacon, and that's been seasoned with mace and nutmeg and a little bit of allspice. So we're just going to go ahead and fill this. And kind of what we want is to just spread it out a little bit so it's not so much centered, but it fills in all of the sides of the pie. Because what we want is that you want the liquid and the juice to kind of seep into the pastry itself. And now we're going to fill our pasty, which that filling is uh, forced pork and beef, what we know is like ground pork and ground beef. Uh, a little bit of bacon, some potato, and turnip. So we want our filling just to be in the middle. Um, not too far caked up, but kind of spread out towards the edges because we'll put our topper on there and we want it to sort of be semi-even. And we also want the juices from this to kind of seep into that crust. All right, now that we have our pies filled, um, we've cut out our tops, which will now move towards the pie itself. And then we'll connect them by just a little bit of water. And then we'll add a little bit of design work um, after we've sealed the top and the bottom and trimmed it up. You just want to make sure everything gets 
connected and it sort of sits on that pie because as it bakes you know the juice will seep down into the crust and we sort of want that top to not get um, influenced by that juice so we'll actually trim it up and we just kind of want to hold it up a little bit we want to leave a little bit of crust on there and it'll tear away as it kind of works itself around and we can use the top as a guide a guide mark because it is not a crust where it goes full way to the top so we can sort of press these two together with that water and almost round the top of it. Just want to make sure that this vessel inside is protected and the only way out of there is actually through a top slit. And this one, since there's no sticking out, we're going to want to rub water when it's lying flat like this because when we crimp it, we'll be crimping it from the sides and not from the top. So we just want to make sure that'll re-ensure that everything stays in there and stays in the middle. Like I said, it's better to have a little bit bigger. That way you can trim off any excess if you need to. Like this part right here is sticking out just a touch. We'll just follow it and sort of trim it up. And then we can just sort of crimp it. All right, so now we've saved our excess pastry dough and um, standing crust pie dough for some shapes. Uh, we have a few leaves here, which we'll cut out. And you know, you can do them as you kind of like. Um, you can also do uh, hearts. Uh, back then, some very delicate drawings were done, um, such as a deer or a fish, um, sometimes a chicken. So we'll take these shapes and we'll do the same thing, you know, with the water and we'll dab a little bit of water on them just to make them stick. And then we'll brush the whole thing with egg yolk just to get a gloss on it and to make it shiny. We'll flip this one out, and then for the pasty, we'll do the same, except this will be straight leaves. And then we'll just sort of cup the, cup the dough again, just to kind of make sure it's, it's tight. And then we have a little bit of egg yolk that we'll add some water to. You can also use cream or milk. Um, I think the water thins it out pretty good. And then we'll brush this on it so it's, you know, a little bit golden. Doesn't have to be too, too much. All right, now we have our pasty and standing crust pie. Uh, we're going to pop them into the oven, uh, maybe about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, but we'll be checking on them about every 10 minutes uh, because these old ovens do have their uh, intricacies and, and uh, uh, defaults, so you know it's good to check every five, 10 minutes just to see where you're at. So we're gonna pop these in the oven. All right, we've pulled our pie and pasty out of the oven here at Stratford Hall in the original 1738 bake oven, and they're ready to enjoy. Uh, we have our pasty on the right and the standing pork crust pie on the left, and I wanna thank you for joining us at Stratford Hall. I'm starving. <laughs> I'm hungry.
<laughs> Seriously, they're so, so good. I hope that everyone that was trying to get on and uh, link up the video found it in the chat. <clears throat> Sorry for disabling it. So let's see here. All right, um, I have a couple of questions to kick it off. So a couple of things. One is, can you give us a little idea of the recipe? So just, you know, proportions. Again, I'm not a baker. I don't like measuring or reading when I cook, but give us an idea of exactly what you put in the crust and what kind of, you know, proportions and et cetera did you put with that meat, like filling? Yeah, so the, the puff paste itself, I mean, there is probably as many puff paste receipts as there are, you know, clouds in the sky on a cloudy day. So it's, there's so many. Um, and some books you'll see six, seven, eight, nine in a row that, you know, the first two will say like puff paste, puff paste for this, puff paste for that. And then they'll say like, and another one, and another one. And, you know, most of these will contain um, not so much like equal parts, but pretty close to like equal parts flour and fat, whether that be like butter, and lard mixed or straight butter. I mean, it kind of depends on regionally where you were at and what you had available to you. Um, so the one that I made was a little bit of lard and like three quarters butter um, in like that kind of temperature, which that was, I think in the fifties or sixties or so like that day, like a nice fall day. And, you know, there's influence of like outside leaking in there, even though you're standing by an oven. Um, <clears throat> it is a little bit of chili. So, you know, it's a little more pliable to work with butter. So, because that hardens up a little bit quicker and you can work with it a little bit easier to make all those folds. So I, what I like to do is like equal parts fat and butter, um, usually by, by, by weight. Um, if you're working in a modern kitchen, usually by weight. And then usually the water proportion, um, you know, I always say like, if it's, you know, a couple pounds of butter, it's like one egg, like one egg for every like up to two pounds of butter. Cause I don't like a lot of egg being like influenced in there because mm -hmm. <clears throat> it doesn't have like the nice pastry layers with egg in it um, when you involve egg. And then the water, like I always, like to use like half the amount of water like by weight and or I don't weigh it at all and I just eyeball it and it's pretty much until it feels right so when I say when it feels right you know when it's like pliable so it's not like wet it shouldn't be squishing in your hands and it shouldn't be crumbling up like little uh <clears throat> like little balls of of dough that just have butter and, and flour in them <laughs> So like little pebbles, it shouldn't be like that. You should be able to like work it and be pliable. Um, and that's pretty much like the crust for both things, even though the standing crust, like I mentioned that some of them were just used as a vessel. Like they just basically- That was so interesting. <laughs> things up in them, like, and, you know, compared to like the video, obviously this is taken in perspective of time and the temperature of the oven. So, you know, obviously a little bit colder of an oven for pies. And since the height and depth and width of that oven, you know, you're still looking at probably, you know, you want to be rocking like a 300 degrees because you wouldn't, um, you know, and this is only for practical purposes, um, for the 18th century, like you're not pre-baking that meat. You're not pre-cooking that meat it's going in there like after it's been, you know, marinated in like red wine and things like that. And it's going in there. So you need to time out your meat cooking with your <laughs> uh, pasty and or pie dough, which it's a little tough, especially like back then, because like you had to be like a master at it because if not, your either meat's not going to be done and it's going to be awful inside. Um, or your meat's going to be cooked and your pastry is going to be falling apart because it's overdone. So like, yeah. you know, you almost want the juices. That's why like most of mine are like, like halfway cooked. So it's like you get the juices still leaking out and it's not like totally dried out and yeah. you want that to kind of coat the bottom. So that's what, that's what keeps like the bottom from like falling apart because there's so much, um, fat mixed in with the meat. And mm -hmm. that's another thing with like pies. <clears throat> really quickly before I go into like the ingredients of the pies and pasty itself 
you know, pies. And you'll see this a lot with like, um, <clears throat> like Yorkshire Christmas pies and things like anything that's like layered meat inside of pastry. There was probably a large amount of fat, like probably equal to the amount of meat. <clears throat> because when that meat cooked and when that fat cooked, you weren't quite necessarily eating this while it's hot. You were probably eating it while it's hot the first time. And then after that, that fat, it served as a preservation method. So inside that pie, you're <laughs> coating it with fat. And it's just like, you know, when the temperature goes down, hopefully, you know, in the summer, this is a little tougher. But, you know, in the, in the fall days when the nights got cooler, you know, that fat would just kind of glaze over and re-harden up and protect all that meat and all the pastry inside. Um, so the fat inside is acting just as, you know, a preservation method, just as you would like any kind of potted meat um, mm -hmm. or poultry or anything like that. You know, you're like adding clarify, you're adding butter that's been melted so much <laughs> that when you pour it over top of it and solidifies, right, thing is getting inside of there you know, not bacteria, not bugs, not anything. <laughs> unless, you know, unless some wild animal like carried away the whole thing, like you, you think <laughs> nothing's getting to it, you know, because it has that solid layer of fat um, over top. But yeah, so the pasty uh, itself, it was like a forced pork, um, which is just, you know, think of like ground pork now, like run through, you know, like a sausage grinder. Um, back then they did have like kind of crude methods of sausage, um, sort of almost like a chopper. I mean, you would <laughs> hand chop the stuff. Um, they did have a method of stuffing things like sausage, but just that forced meat, you know, it was, it's basically what it sounds like. You know, it's just, it's forced meat into, into an encasement or, you know, just like ground. So it'd be real finely chopped. And then usually a method of like vegetables, depending on where you were at um, regionally and seasonally, um, depended on what was in there you know, the ranges of meat and pies and pasties, you know, most commonly is like lamb. Like you find lamb oh. probably more than anywhere. Um, and that goes for anywhere sort of regionally. Mm -hmm. um, because most of these uh, pasties, you know, kind of originated um, in England, you know, a lot, a lot say over by the Cornwall region because of all the mining um, in the 17th and 18th centuries. And that's why like the transition from um, those miners over to, um, you know, the colonies and then the United States eventually. And that's why, you know, majority of, uh, pasties you will see like in upper Michigan where there was mining, uh, you mm -hmm. know, simple to eat, but these styles of pasties are very intricate. They're very delicate. They're designed extremely well and they're, you know, not everybody is eating these, you know, right. You know, you're not going to pull into a tavern and like get this <laughs> with like deer carved on top of them and such. And like the amount of intricacy um, from these was, you know, Edward Kidder um, came out with a book in the 1720s. Yeah. Did um, you want to show those images? Yeah, I wanted to see them. You talked about that before we got on here. All right. Should be able to share your screen. He's got some goodies for us. So this is what the front of the book, his book cover looked like. Um, and, you know, he was a teacher that taught in two different places. And actually, you can actually see the inscription like this book was for the use of his scholars. That's so cool. And the interesting thing is, so everybody got one of these books that entered his class um, it had his picture on the front of it, and then it had Edward Kidder's receipts of pastry and cookery for the use of his scholars, and then it was a blank book. So you basically copied what he taught you from his recipes. He did publish this book, but these were, um, some copies are still found from other people's handwriting um, with, from his class. So the crazy thing is, um, if you want kind of kind of a time capsule thing, if you can read, like he teaches at his school in on Queen Street, and then on the bottom it says at Furnival's Inn in Holborn. So that's crazy. And then the bottom line said, "Ladies may be taught at their own houses." So which leads me to believe that 
he didn't allow women into his classes at those places he came to your house. Um, and this is a picture of the designs that- That's amazing. I, oh, I, look at that little pig face, little yep. pig head at the bottom. And so like, you know, the wild boar and everyone was like catered towards its own filling. So obviously like, you know, it, it really depends on what it sounds like he was more interested in some kind of design. Um, sometimes it had to do with the actual filling. Sometimes it didn't. You can obviously see the wild boar pie. There's a wild boar. And then the lamb pasty, there is a bird. And the outside, it's really interesting because, um, you know, it leads you to believe that he's cutting that to make it look like rope, but it's probably braided in pieces and then stuck on there like water and egg like we said before. Um, and then here's another one of a fish pie. And, you know, the bottom one is actually the fish. And then he's actually showing you the design next to the fish on what the fish would look like and or square round. Um, both of those pies um, that contain fish. And then there's one last one that is a bunch of different pasty designs. You can see the one with the deer. Um, you can also see a few with some birds and they're just so intricate. Um, and these are for, um, for both uh, uh, tarts and pasties um, kind of interchangeably. Um, so let's see. All right. They're so beautiful. Am I back? <laughs> Trying to get off. Yeah. Stop participant sharing. <laughs> I can kick you off. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Okay, so, um, we yeah. do have some questions here. So I mean, go ahead and finish your thought, but. Yeah. So, you know, just, just kind of the, the intricacies of those designs. And if you flip through his book, you know, it's 1720s, so by that time he's plagiarized, plagiarized at least, you know, 40, 50 <laughs> years of people. Um, and then the thing is, is that he's on the beginning of the downfall of bad plagiarism. So he's pretty far up there. Like I would, I would say most of his things, you'll see his work um, appear in um, Hannah Glass and you'll see his stuff and a few of the, um, uh, Housewives of Virginia, and then you also see his work in um, a few other books. It's it's just crazy, but um, it's yeah, the the skill level of that though is just it's pretty awesome. Yeah, no, really incredible. I mean, such an art to food, you know, amazing. So Doreen asks, who served these dishes at the table? I think it depended on where you were at, at the Lees at Stratford. It would have been enslaved waiters. People like Sonny that we know of, who was a manservant and a waiter in the dining room and other places. I mean, I imagine that smaller, you know, northern areas, it would have been all yeah, different kinds of folks, right? New England, actually, they were quite popular, even as far back as like the 1690s. So, you know, in that work, you're talking about a lot more different <laughs> variety of things. So, you know, we're talking um, berries and venison and things that weren't, weren't so uh, domestically raised, um, more of like wild game kind of things. Um, and that could be, you know, wild juniper berries and, you know, cranberries. When you think of New England, you think of like those, like those berry and game like mixes. Oh, um, that sounds incredible. Favorite. I can't even. And, oh. you know, but yeah. And actually to roll back real quick on like the types of flour, the two types of flour that I used were white lamas um, and, and a spelt, and both of those were grown um, at Stratford in the 18th century, most definitely milled at um, Stratford Mill in the 18th century. Um, so that's kind of why I picked those two things, because probably an allotment was put aside for household use. So actually spelt does improve the um, crispiness of the crust um, due to the hardness and the protein content of spelt itself. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like a hard wheat. Um, it really lends a hand with the butter to make that um, that pastry really crispy. 
Mm, so good. All right, Mike asks, can you bake in a Dutch oven if you do not have a bake oven? Yep, most definitely. <laughs> most definitely. They, you know, work. Yeah, how would you convert that to a Dutch so, oven and a regular oven? You know, basically you'd still um, use a pan for that pastry. You would just use it inside of the Dutch oven with both bottom and top heat. And, you know, those things also, when you're using it, they have to be, you know, just like think of a Dutch oven as a smaller version of the oven at Stratford Hall because you shut the door on it. So just think of that as like <laughs> a little more a, controlled. A <laughs> little more controlled, a little quicker to heat up. But, you know, you definitely have to make sure that you preheat that Dutch oven both top and bottom heat before, you know, you don't need to do it too much, but, you know, just to knock off the chill. So when you drop that um, small pie pan or whatever with the meat pie in it, in there that it, it's gaining that first heat. So it doesn't like melt the butter or fat out of your pastry. And then you're left with a very sad pastry, um, but it needs to be <laughs> hot and then to remain hot. And it, yeah, you can definitely, use that. And sometimes it's, it's a lot quicker. It, it works a lot faster because it's a smaller, uh, literally a smaller oven. Um, That's awesome. All right. Great question, Mike. Thank you. And Doreen asks, what was the same crust used for fruit pies? And I would love to, for you to talk about, you know, sort of the birth of fruit pies and sweet pies and all those kinds of things. Yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting question because, you know, fruit pies, they existed not as long as like savory pies, but you know, they were still popular. I mean, we're talking 13th and 14th century, um, you know, seeing probably the first apple pie in the latter part of the 14th century. And that's just because somebody wrote it down. It's not that they didn't do it. Um, and it's not to say that, that those apples were treated like we treat apples today, you know, and like, you know, add a little bit of sugar and brown sugar and put them inside of a crust. Um, but the whole thing with like fruit pies, definitely they started more as an open tart or tort, you know, that they started more open like that because they didn't quite want to close it up so much because that was thought to be, you know, for meat pies. And the difference in the doughs, I mean, it's not really that different. Um, it's just depending on what is your filling and what's going in it. You know, when we think of, I think everything was a little bit thicker back then, because if you remember, it had to, it had to take all the juices from either the fruit or the meat. It had to withstand those and stand up to them. So, you know, it's not like you could pop it in the fridge after you were done, you know, <laughs> taking a piece out or warming it up. Um, these things didn't have anything to go into, you know, I mean, it's some cold storage rooms or whatnot, but not something that you could just like, oh, I'm going to cover it with plastic wrap and stick it in. Um, so for the majority, you know, I think open crust, most of them were like finished. You're not, you're not serving it like a meat pie where, you know, for the next two days, this is what you're eating. Um, for like, it's true. yeah, for real, you're, you're They're not, quite you're, large. I mean, those things, oh, some feed of them are giant. A family, a big family. Yeah, <laughs> so huge. And the fact is that, uh, you know, different, I think honestly, different crusts, um, different puff paste, different thickness for what you're putting inside of it. Um, you know, if it's a big standing crust pie, I mean, if you have layers like this, because, you know, especially if uh, you look at some of the inventories on some of the sizes of the pans, you're actually wondering how they pulled that off with the equipment that they have, I mean, behind Kelly is this giant hearth, but like, imagine a 40 gallon Dutch oven, you know, not a 40 quart, a 40 gallon. It's like so, a fish tank. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's giant. So it's like, how is that? How is, and then, you know, you see some of these pies and cakes and things like that, that were baked. And it's like, how did they do it? Was it like a combination? Because anything bigger if it cannot fit through that door in the oven, then it's being done over the hearth for a long period of time. And, you know, some of the layers of things that have, you know, seven and eight different proteins in it, you know, and all various different cuts of meat. You know, this is the other thing that I think we take for granted is, you know, when we make, you know, savory pies and things like that, if we're using full cuts of meat in there, it's, you know, maybe it's, 
poultry thigh or, or breast or something like that, but they were using like braising cuts of meat in there. So that had to marinate and cook and almost like with all that fat in there, it almost like braised itself in butter inside of the pie shell. Oh, that sounds then, so good. <laughs> you, know, you were just using that crust as like the vehicle. So, <laughs> you know, it's like the amount of weight that these things were, obviously there were smaller ones too. And sometimes they would have a variety of smaller, um, smaller meat pies that were, you know, taller, cylindrical, um, that would be on the table kind of in various spots and they might've been different proteins, but, you know, to make these big ones, especially like around, um, you know, like the holiday season, like that, like Christmas time, like they are massive because they're expecting either a large amount of people or they just prepared for a large amount of people, even though there was the same amount of people just in case somebody showed up. Um, but yeah, the, the, the sheer, the sheer size of, um, the different cuts of, of, of pies and, and pasties, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, to re-answer the question, it's, it's really the thickness depends on what you're putting in it and how long you intend on keeping it for. Um, you know, the, the introduction of, of fruit pies as we know it, you know, there's a few mentions um, in the 1790s of, of apple pies, like covered apple pies, like, like we know it. Um, but a lot of those pies were really not meant for eating like we know apple pie, um, you know. Right. Uh, cider and some even, you know, receipts call for apples to be in savory pies. Um, and there is actually in that pasty, there is apples um, in that pasty. And it's, you know, meant to be a, a sweet addition without adding sugar, which was very expensive. Um, so just to get that tartness and acidicness in there, um, you know, most of the time apples, apples were used, even a weird combination sometimes of apples, turnips, eggs, like hard boiled eggs. Oh, and interesting. Yeah, it's just, you know, and onions, like all those things come yeah. down, um, kind of baked together, uh, kind of make a, a weird, like kind of tasty combination because it's like, it's like a little bit sweet, a little bit savory. Um, texturally, and, yeah. super interesting with the, the eggs yes, too. Because, yeah. Because like yolks, like yolks of eggs yeah. make an interesting <laughs> texture of about everything and you know also there's there's talks of like you know um pies and bowls being interchanged with terminology that wasn't what we know pies and pasties and and things like that um things were just treated as vessels like loaves of bread um or you know like we said before like the pastry shells they were treated as vehicles which is I, I feel like it's an extreme waste of, of butter. You know, good dough, right? Potential to have a nice flaky dough on something. You know, so we got some, like, go ahead. When the like amount of labor that went into these things and it's just like. Oh. Right. <laughs> really just a case to hold your meat. <laughs> here, here it goes into the trash heap and it's like. Uh. <laughs> so Amanda wants to know more about the iron pans that you baked with um, but before yeah that's fine go ahead we have a, a comment from Tony saying yes I was thinking about Christmas cake recipes never thought what they would sorry what they put them in to cook so it's a giant Dutch oven wow so that was a comment but yeah Amanda wants to know more about those amazing pans that you have yeah so both of those um both of the uh iron pans that I cooked in in that oven they're both original one is pre pre 1750s um which the condition of it you would never know because it's it's near near perfect condition um one just because it was cared very well for over that vast amount of time before i acquired it and also it's built really well um it's built unbelievably well and you can honestly tell like the um the workmanship and the change in the iron from about 1750 either backwards or forwards um, and we're talking about um, most cast um, that I all the stuff that I used was you know made in the colonies um, and or before or after the revolution so 
Um, this is none of its English cast or Dutch cast, which sometimes involves different um, different things that they're cast into. So you know, if it's like a Dutch oven, um, that that usually refers to it being um, the mold itself. It's being cast in something different than uh, sand. It might be cast in clay, and clay works a little bit better to cast, but. Um, so you can tell the, the change in the pans by the thinness of the handles. Um, and that doesn't apply for literally every pan, but the pans that I was using, um, they had two little uh, ears on the side of the pan that you grip it with a uh, bale. And if you notice too, that those two pans did not have any type of um, equipment to lift it from the top, like it didn't have anything attached. And usually they would call those baleless pans. And there was a tool, which I also have an original, um, and there's quite a few of them floating around. They actually look like, they look like tongs that you're grabbing like ice with, but they're actually used for, to put into those side ears and pick it up and then remove it. So the handle never gets hot because it's never quite over the fire, never in the oven. You're just using it to put in and take out. Um, so the thinness of those ears on the outside of the cast that is how you can tell it's a little bit earlier um, because as the 18th century moved on, um, especially after the revolution, um, because uh, we needed a good bit of that iron uh, mm -hmm. during the revolution, um, not only to build quite a few projects um, like the chain link that uh, was across the Hudson Valley to block the British, which you can imagine how much iron it took to do that. Um, you know, they got a little bit thicker. So, you know, post 1780s, the pans are a little bit thicker. Um, and you can see the second pan, the one that the pasty was done in, it's a little bit of a lower rim. And what's great about that pan is it doesn't have such high sides and you can literally scoop um, with a spatula and or like an 18th century, like a spade was what they call it, or a slice. Um, you can You can slip that in there and it's so nice because it's, it's deep, it has a crevice, but it's not so deep that it's not like you're gonna break whatever's in there um, whenever you're cooking it. But that is actually a very heavy pan. The pasty pan is probably about 27 pounds. It, it's a good chunk of iron. And that actually did have a bale that was no longer attached. Um, so that's more of like a backcountry piece of cast uh, because there's just, there's just too much, the, 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 it's actually pitted quite a bit which means at one point in time, probably in the 18th century, it had a lot of iron that's missing now. So if it was heavy, if it's heavy now, it would have been about three pounds heavier then um, because the pitting has taken away some of that cast. But yeah, if, if, if you can ever get your hands on some like 18th or even 19th century cast, like please do because those pans are just phenomenal to work with. They're like the original nonstick, you know, right. People think not, that they stick, but they don't. You got a good yeah. cast iron skillet and you're oh, good yeah. to go. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Any other questions on this chilly night before Thanksgiving? <laughs> I like the idea of using leftover turkey, <laughs> turkey pot pie, like one of yeah. those. No, no, that's like a fantastic, like, seriously, like turkey turkey pasties maybe take some of the cranberries and mm. fold it in there and you know because mm. i'll be uh put the gravy in there so it doesn't dry out <laughs> oh yeah yeah because i think everybody that's attending they'll get um i'll attach a copy and you kind of the filling is really up to the independent person you know because i it depends on honestly what you have it's it's better to use stuff that you have instead of buying new new things mm -hmm. so you know i'll 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 get over uh, to y'all a uh, copy of a nice puff paste recipe. So maybe you can whip that up tomorrow, leave it in the fridge yeah. after Thanksgiving, and then take that, wrap it all up in a puff paste and bake it. And uh, that'll be a perfect holiday after, after treat. And uh, so you're not so sick of eating turkey and stuffing and cranberry. It'll be a, in a new form two days later. <laughs> that does help with leftovers. We have another question from Doreen. She asks, was soup served often or was it a rare offering? Um, so, you know, soup, as part of the meal, it depends on what kind of form of dining you were having, whether it was like <laughs> um, a la Francais or a, a different type. It depends on what part of the meal. 
Um, I don't think soups were not like standalone meals, especially in these types of, um, you know, situations at like Stratford, like it wasn't, you know, like a tavern where you went in and you got, <laughs> you know, some bread and you got some soup or stew. Um, and that was like your meal for the evening. You know, it, it was, it was coursed out in a way that um, things would come out and happen that I think as today, as we know meals, we, our minds would be like blown because it's just like things would kind of keep coming in an order that doesn't make sense to us now <laughs> but at the same time back then it made perfect sense so y there was soups and I think they were quite common in, in bigger households but it just wasn't served as kind of a standalone um, and not even more as a side it was it was more of a um, a course that almost could like savor the tongue to, to keep going you know like to, to move things along as, as things keep on coming. And I think too, it's a real big difference too between the different you know classes of folks and where they were, et cetera. So I know the enslaved community definitely re relied on soups because they were literally living off, living off of the rations that were given to them weekly and sort of trying to gather things to make different things to sustain themselves, right? During yeah. enslavement. So the, the, you know, the spectrum is huge when you start thinking about that kind of thing. Uh, yeah it's like the the in between classes and cultures there's <laughs> i feel like somebody should write a book but there is too much there's, there's so much right because it's i said what we know a majority 95 percent of it is of people of a certain class mm -hmm. and that's just because that's what was documented now we're not accounting for the other things which is also and sometimes it's better than <laughs> It's, it's better than word documentation is oral history because that is mm -hmm. tradition that kind of keeps on. And almost I tend to believe that more than I tend to believe stuff that's publicated. <laughs> Seriously, or recipes, you know, they do change yeah. a little bit, but sort of yeah. the, the bones of them, for lack of a better phrase, tend to stay yeah. somewhat the same. It also shows like adaptation of different cultures in different areas. Uh -huh. which always sort of blows my mind because it's, you know, you're using what you had when you had it, depending on the season and if you had it. And it also depended on a bunch of other things. Like what if there was a, you know, not a so great year for corn? Uh -huh. Well, that's awful because <laughs> most of people's diets relied on corn. Um, and that's both, you know, indigenous and, you know, African-American and slave and, and like <laughs> a lot. A lot mm -hmm. so you know if you don't have that and if you don't have a good corn year you probably don't have a good wheat year right all those things also depend on tobacco so if everything's <laughs> having a bad year you're not doing well so yeah no kroger's or food lines back yeah. in the day no. No. any other questions before we wrap this up on this chilly night and justin you said you're going to get that recipe out to folks we can yep. send it out we can put it, do you have it handy? You want to put it in the chat or do you want to just do it later? Um, I'll probably do it. Um, I'll, I'll probably, I can forward it tomorrow and then. Okay, we'll send it out tomorrow to the group. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Fantastic. All right, last call for questions. Thank you so much. I am salivating at those <laughs> those pies. They're so beautiful and they tasted so good too. I mean, I remember I tasted the meat even when it was cold and it was fantastic. Right. And I think that was like more of the point a little bit just to kind of like carry over. So it was like, you know, let's take this and let's make it so in two days, it's not going to be awful and it's okay to eat it cold. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's, it was probably preferred to be eaten cold or room temperature, to be honest. So that's, yeah. that's kind of a thing that really carries, that really carries on um, in both the way that we think now about food mm -hmm. from the way uh, you know food was thought about then too 
Awesome. All right, Dontavious, woo, one of our other uh, fellow historic uh, folk, foodways folks and resident cook at Stratford says thanks for another great program. You all have to zoom in in the spring. He's going to be um, featuring some pretty amazing programs. And Becky Childress, who's a good supporter of Stratford, says thanks to us both. And then um, a question about the video from last week. It will be emailed to you if you hadn't um, if you hadn't received it. So just email me directly if you missed something from last week. So yeah, um, please also sign up for our Foodways, our next Foodways program that's sponsored by Mars Chocolate. Um, we're doing a chocolate program on December 7th and it's all about enslaved laborers and chocolatiers and gender and all kinds of fantastic the conversations that we're going to be having there as well. Um, there's a link in the chat or the Q&A to the Edward Kidders uh, pasty. So thank you for that. And yeah, I think that's it. So have a wonderful night. Thank you, Justin. It's always nice to have you on. Yeah, I look forward you. to you coming down, um, cooking at Stratford and Dontavious and Amy and the crew will all welcome you back um, next time you come to Stratford. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving to everyone. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. All right, good night everyone.